God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I haven't met a lot of you yet, but my name is Daniel Behrens, and I'm serving as a curate over at St. Peter's Anglican Church. Um, that's a term that a lot of people aren't familiar with. It's a post-seminary internship. So I've gone through seminary, and now this is sort of the next step of getting real-world experience, but still really with an expectation that it's a learning thing and not just, uh, you know how to do everything perfectly already. <laughs> so part of what I get to do over this year is to visit a variety of different local churches. And that's how I'm, I find myself here with you this morning. Uh, Mother Travis asked me if I could uh, preach uh, during her absence. And so that's what I'm here to do. And I'm excited about what God has for us this morning. So what does it mean to have an epiphany? We are in the season of epiphany, and we started on the day of epiphany. So what is that? It's some sort of a, a new realization, maybe an aha moment. It's not necessarily that something was not true and then became true, but something was outside of our sight, and then we, we see it again. We have an epiphany. It's a sad fact of our human existence that our vision is actually extremely limited. What we see with our eyes and what we see with our minds. There is much that we do not see. <coughs> I think of this when, I, when I'm sent into the pantry to look for something. <laughs> and I have been told emphatically that it exists. It is there. And yet, I cannot see it. <laughs> Until Rebecca comes in there with me and says, right there. And I have an epiphany. Aha! <laughs> I think about an x-ray or maybe an ultrasound too. It's not changing what's happening inside your body, but it shows you what's going on. It shows you what was already there. We're actually expecting our first child right now, and we've been able to receive a lot of ultrasounds, and it's just so mind-boggling. The baby is there all the time. But it takes that, that moment of the ultrasound to show you, my goodness, she has fingers and toes and hair. And like, it's fully, well, almost fully formed human in there. It's an epiphany. The last Sunday, Father Michael was with you, and he spoke about how in his baptism, Jesus is shown, he's revealed, there's an epiphany that he is the servant Messiah and the royal Messiah. This morning's Gospel reading invites us to continue looking and to see something more about our Lord Jesus. And that is that He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's an incredibly rich phrase. I know that Charles Spurgeon, the famous preacher, he preached at least three sermons on just that verse alone. So we're not going to exhaust its riches this morning. But I want us to focus on this fact, that Jesus, the Lamb of God, is the only one who takes away the sin of the world. He's the only one. What does it mean when John says that Jesus is the Lamb of God? What comes to your mind when you hear the word Lamb? If we uh, step outside of a church context for a moment, and someone said, you're acting like a lamb today, or something like that, uh, what, would, what would they be saying? Maybe some sort of uh, innocence, uh, naivete perhaps, maybe uh, playfulness or meekness, uh, sort of an, an embodiment of innocence. Now, if we look at the Old Testament, we do see that innocence, but we also see something more. Lambs show up in the Old Testament in many places as an innocent substitute. Not just innocent, a substitute. So I want us to look at just a couple uh, poignant examples from the Old Testament where we see lambs and also sometimes a young goat, which is sort of similar. Think with me of Abraham and his son Isaac walking up the Mount of Sacrifice. And remember Abraham's prophetic word to Isaac. He says, God will provide for himself a lamb for a burnt offering, my son. 
God does provide a lamb that day. And Isaac is spared. Think of the first Passover in Exodus, where God instructs his people, instructs every family to take a lamb without blemish, to kill it, and to spread the blood over their doorposts. And hear God's promise. When he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. The firstborn of Israel are spared because of the sacrifice of an innocent lamb. <coughs> Lastly, think of the annual Day of Atonement that God commanded his people to observe. There were two young goats sacrificed on that day, among other things. The first goat was simply slain, and its blood was sprinkled into the most holy place. The second goat, however, something different happened to this one. The high priest took that goat, and he laid his hands on its head. And he confessed over it, and I quote from Leviticus here, all the iniquities of the people of Israel, and all their transgression, and all their sins. And he shall put them on the head of the goat, and send it away into the wilderness. The goat shall bear away all their iniquities on itself to a remote area. So just think with me of, of what those stories of, of Isaac, the first Passover, and the Day of Atonement, and the liturgy of sacrifice, what that would have taught the people of Israel. I believe it would have shown them the seriousness of sin. That's the wages of sin truly are death. And it would have shown that we can't deal with our own sin. We can't be our own sacrifice. It requires the death of another, of an innocent lamb, for us to be declared innocent. So with this Old Testament background fresh in our minds, hear again the words of John the Baptist as he sees Jesus coming toward him. Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb. The Lamb. The ultimate Lamb. Not just one more Lamb. Not just another year's sacrifice or another day's. But the Lamb. The Lamb of God. Not the Lamb that we provide. Not a Lamb that is our idea. But one that God provides. Gospel writer John has already told us that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Creator, co-equal and co-eternal with the Father. This is not just another animal or even another normal person, but it's God Himself coming as a Lamb. And what does the Lamb do? What does the Lamb come to accomplish? He has a mission. And John the Baptist tells us what that is. It is to take away the sin, not just of one person, not just of one family, not even just of a nation, but of the whole world. May we not grow dull to these so important and yet familiar to many of us words. When our God, who is in himself perfect love, comes to us, he comes to do the most loving, and the most difficult thing imaginable, to take away our sin. I think we sometimes forget that sin really is the world's deepest problem. But God knows that it is sin that has introduced unimaginable woe into the world. If we were to somehow take away all the world's weapons, or take away drugs and alcohol, or take away pornography, or even take away radical Islam, racism, poverty, all these things. If we were to take away all those things, if God does not take away our sin, then we are still under a curse. And we are still doomed to suffer and die. In his infinite wisdom and love, the Lamb of God comes to take away our sin. How did the lambs in the Old Testament do that? How did they take away guilt? It was by dying. And it is no different with the Lamb of God. 
In John's Gospel, if we continue reading, Jesus' death, his crucifixion, is presented as a Passover. John wants us to know that Jesus is the ultimate Passover lamb. In John's Gospel, Jesus is slain on the day of preparation, the day when the lambs, the Passover lambs, were slain. And he goes out of his way to tell us that hyssop was used at Jesus' crucifixion. And hyssop is what God had told his people to spread the blood with on the doorposts. And most clearly of all, John tells us in chapter 19, quote, These things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. That's at the point where we hear of Jesus' side being pierced instead of his legs being broken. John is quoting directly from Exodus 12, the instructions for the first Passover. John wants us to know that Jesus is the Passover lamb. He is the true lamb who takes away the sin of the world. This may be a strange thing to say, but I hope that nothing I've just said is new to you. I hope that you know, and I believe many of you do, that Jesus is the Lamb who takes away our sin, and who takes away the sin of the world. And yet, I believe that even if we've known this our whole lives, we need every day a fresh epiphany, a fresh realization of this fact. We need to hear the voice of John the Baptist just as much as the crowd by the Jordan River. We need to behold the Lamb afresh today. Why do I think that we forget? Why do I think that we need a fresh epiphany? Well, let me give two examples of ways that we, I believe, stop beholding our Lamb. One is that we despair over our sin. Do you ever get weary of battling the same habits and ungodly patterns that just seem to keep popping up no matter what you do? How many times have you hurt someone and apologized and, and, and committed yourself to do better and then fallen back into the same sin? Do you ever just feel like you will never change? Or do you look at the world around us and see a seemingly endless flood of, of bloodshed and greed and prejudice and hatred and racism and just feel like, you know what, it's probably just always going to be this way. I don't see anything really changing and, and it's probably even going to get worse. You ever feel that way? It's very understandable to feel that way, but we as God's people have a reason to be hopeful. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Even if change is imperceptibly slow, and even if things to be, seem to be getting worse, Jesus is taking away the sin of the world. As God's own Lamb, God Himself, He cannot fail. He has already paid the price, and He will most certainly bring His work to completion. Don't forget the good news of Revelation, that the Lamb who was slain returns and he will fully establish his reign. Another way I believe that we stop beholding the Lamb is that we fall into what you might call self-sufficiency. This isn't the attitude that says, I will never change, but it's, I'm going to change myself. I've got this. I can handle this. This is disturbingly easy to fall into. We're not usually consciously saying, I don't need the Lamb of God. Jesus came for no reason. But we live like that's true by keeping our sin hidden or by excusing it or by just making one more plan to deal with it ourselves. Shouldn't we know better? Shouldn't we, like the children of Israel, see that we cannot deal with our own sin? The sacrifice of an innocent lamb is needed. When we see Jesus, when we behold the Lamb, we remember that it is not we who take away our sin, but only Him. He is the only one who takes away the sin of the world. So those are two ways that we stop beholding the Lamb. Despair, 
self-sufficiency. But if we put it positively, what does it look like? What does it look like when we are beholding the Lamb? To answer that question, I want to share in closing a story about Charles Simeon, which beautifully ties together the lambs of the Old Testament, Christ himself, and the Eucharist, which we'll be receiving in just a few moments. As you may know, Charles Simeon was an influential pastor in England during the early 1800s. He became a prominent leader in the early evangelical movement. Now, interestingly, Simeon did not grow up with much interest in religion. But, when he began attending university at Cambridge, part of his uh, requirement there was that he was to attend chapel and receive Holy Communion. Schools have changed a little bit since then. <laughs> Somehow, in this duty, God gave him a sense that the Eucharist was a sacred thing and that he needed to prepare in some way to receive it. Simeon wrote in his diary that he realized quote, that Satan himself was as fit to attend as I, and that if I must attend to receive Holy Communion, I must prepare for my attendance there. Upon realizing this, Simeon undertook a rigorous course of self-examination, fasting, reading. He writes, within the three weeks, I made myself quite ill with reading, fasting, and prayer. <laughs> Yet despite his efforts, he still felt unfit to receive the Eucharist. So he worked harder, he intensified his efforts, he read more about the meaning of communion, he examined himself more, and he tried and tried and tried to undo his former sins. And yet, despite his many efforts, he could not escape a sense of the awful weight of his sin. Can you relate with that? Trying so hard to make ourselves worthy and failing again and again? But the story doesn't end there. During Holy Week, the week before Easter, Simeon was reading a book which was speaking of the Jewish sacrifices in the Old Testament and how the participants would transfer their sin to the head of their offering. Simeon had an epiphany. And this is what he says. What? May I transfer all my guilt to another? From that moment on, I sought to lay my sins on the sacred head of Jesus. And on the Wednesday, I began to have a hope of mercy. And on the Thursday, that hope increased. And on Friday and Saturday, it became more strong. And on the Sunday, Easter day, I awoke early with those words on my lips and my heart. Jesus Christ is risen today. Alleluia, alleluia. From that hour, peace flowed in rich abundance into my soul. And at the Lord's table in our chapel, I had the sweetest access to God through my blessed Savior. May that be true for us this morning as we come to the Lord's table. The Lamb has come. He has been slain. He has been raised again. All of that is true whether we see it or not. <coughs> and all that, is, all that is given to us today is to behold, to behold the Lamb and to know that He has indeed taken away the sin of the world. And we, like Charles Simeon, may enjoy sweet access to God through our blessed Savior. Amen. <clears throat>